Um, he works in the uh, electronics and computer science department there, doing research in um, wireless systems and related things. So Graham's going to talk for you, talk to you for 10 or 15 minutes about um, matter. Quite warm up here. Anyway, so who am I? Um, as Tim's just said, I'm a lecturer at the University of Southampton. Um, I actually teach networking to every single computer science student that comes through our computer science program. So that's part one, part two, and part three. So they get me for the whole lot talking about pretty much every topic into networking that they could possibly want. Um, I run networking related individual projects, so this year I've had all sorts of fun ones. I've got a student trying to actually simulate matter, which we're talking about today. Got a student trying to reverse engineer the old 6XS um, tunnel broker server side of things, and people doing weird network audio using precision time protocol. So lots and lots of weird networking topics. Um, my PhD was actually in deploying 6LOPAN for environmental sensor networks. So I've taken IPv6 and got that running halfway up a mountain in Scotland. There's a couple of slides on it later. Um, and in my PhD, Viva, I was able to sit there, ping these nodes that were over low power radio, just up the side of a mountain in Scotland over a satellite connection using tunnel brokered IPv6, and it was working from our lab in university. And I'm just a general network pest to our IT guys. Um, and I've been playing with IPv6 for a long time. So I started off with 6XS Tunnel Broker at home back in something like 2010. Uh, went over to Hurricane Electric, and finally, thanks to Tube, I'm now native IPv6 after however many years. Um, so yeah, bit of an IPv6 proponent or evangelist, if you want the terms. Um, so this talk's obviously about IoT because it's matter-based. So what do we mean by Internet of Things? Those of you who are at the Enterprise Workshop this slide's the same. Things are physical objects that are instrumented or um, actuated with a digital presence. It could be fridges. Um, it could be click. Yeah, it could be fridges, or it could be an entire mountainscape in land somewhere. I mean, we've done glaciers, we've done mountains, we've done forests, all sorts. And the question is, what is the IoT device? Um, is it your individual sensor node, or is it the object that you're um, instrumenting. Far too philosophical for now, so I'm just going to say it could be anything. And internet is obviously um, something that can be interacted remotely, but not necessarily over the internet, despite being called Internet of Things. IoT tends to have a lot of connectivity options. Um, why is there animations on this slide? <laughs> Where are the click even? Click no work. <laughs> yep, there we go. Um, yeah, so you've got all sorts of options that people are connecting with. Bluetooth for short range stuff. Uh, wi Fi is quite common in the home automation scene, obviously. Uh, 5G, GPRS, uh, MB IoT, narrowband IoT is a big one that's taking off just because it is designed for sort of machine to machine stuff. Um, and then you've also got all the low power sort of radio. Um, there are loads more low power radio than what we've got up here, but Thread, Zigbee, Z-Wave, 802.15.4, LoRaWAN, they're all the big ones. So there's a range of technologies. They're all disparate. And one thing you'll probably note is not all of them have IP addresses, which is a bit of a pain if you're trying to do big interconnected systems. So you get onto this whole concept of you've got IoT um, without... Uh, no. Um, we've got IoT without internet addresses, and this has obviously led to basically a big sprawl of cloud-based uh, solutions where you are tied into a vendor-specific proprietary cloud system for your IoT devices. Um, it also then means that you can't interact with devices directly. So this is a huge problem if you want to do things on your own or you want data coming into your own servers rather than having to go via a cloud. This isn't a problem that is um, solely IoT, though. Um, if anyone's got an EV charger, how many of you have actually tried to use your EV charger when the internet connection's down? You'll find some of the time that you can't do much with it at all, 
you can't override your schedule, you're stuck. Um, there was something in the news not too long ago, there was a chap whose internet connection was down, ISP couldn't fix it for months for whatever reason, they couldn't charge their car because they changed when they were working, their default schedule now didn't line up with when they were actually at home. And that's the sort of situation we're stuck in where you're stuck using the cloud with um, proprietary IoT. So the way that you can go about doing this, though, is to roll out global addresses to lower power devices. Um, so one of the technologies that's sort of fundamental to this has come out of the Six Low Working Group and Clicky, thank you. It's uh, called Six Low Pen. Um, so this is essentially IPv6 over 802.15.4 radio links. Um, these links have really tiny MTUs. I mean, you're talking 127-byte 120, frames total. Um, what you'll find a lot in these networks is that you've got a lot of compression and a lot of fragmentation. The big thing of 6 low pan is header compression, where you will take the full 48 bytes of an IPv6 and a UDP header, you can compress that down to as small as six bytes. And that's then pulling in information from the, um, the physical layer header for MAC addresses, et cetera, for inferring addresses. Um, there's lots of assumptions that are well-defined in the standards, but this works. Um, and you can get global IPv6 connectivity to small microcontroller-based devices with very small frames. You can also do weird things if you want, like multi-hop mesh networking, so you can have long chains of uh, devices, and everything's quite happy. Um, so we actually deployed this technology back in 24 or 2015. This was a project that was running at the same time as my PhD. And we basically did a pretty much full standards-based network stack um, where we use microcontroller-based nodes hanging off the edge of a satellite-based network using tunneled IPv6 and then six low pan out to the sensor nodes. Um, we were using 802.15.4 sub gigahertz so we could get several kilom kilometers range between the nodes, 802.15.4 MAC, then running six low pan with RPL, and on top of that, UDP and co-app. I'm not going to go into the details of co-app, but think like really lightweight HTTP. And what we did with this <coughs> was a crazy deployment where we were going from um, a shed that happened to have Wi-Fi internet and power all the way up the side of a mountain in Scotland and then doing a multi-hop mesh network. The hardware, small devices, tiny microcontroller. But the deployment, we had three kilometer plus radio links. We were um, covering a site that was over five kilometers wide with a... <coughs> oh. with a multi-hop mesh network. Um, yes, single points of failure. This was research project, so not full-blown deployment. But this is the sort of thing you can do with these technologies. Now, technology has obviously moved along since then. Standards have moved along. Thread is sort of an evolution on top of 6 Lopan. It basically introduces that stack that we saw previously adds a few extra bits for provision and security, and makes it more production ready. And then this is where Matter comes in. Matter builds on top of Thread, and is essentially now a royalty-free open source standard for IoT. It's essentially designed to take a load of the problems that I highlighted earlier, where you've got this disparate array of connectivity standards and ways of doing things, and bring them all onto one unified umbrella. Um, predominantly focused on smart home, but we are looking at how you can apply this for the environmental sensing that we do. Um, fundamentally, you'll find this is already out there in things like Amazon Alexa, Apple Home, uh, Google Home, Samsung Smart Things. The hubs are already out there. Anything that they've produced in the last few years has already had software updates to enable Matter um, compliance. But functionally, it unifies compliant Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, low-power radio into one deployment, so you haven't got to go through the horribleness of, OK, which app do I have to use to manage my light bulb, because I've also got a Wi-Fi uh, baby monitor or whatever. It's all unified. You can all theoretically use one control plane. So on the technical level, matter, clicker of doom, um, 
is pretty much a stack with options on what you're running at different levels. Um, it will work with Ethernet, Wi-Fi, 802.15.4, or even Bluetooth. Um, Google have a much better Meta Prime than I can put up here, but um, this is just to highlight that it's all six low pan on the Wi-Fi, Ethernet, and 802.15.4 side. Runs with UDP and then standardizes the Matter application on top. And once you've got the stack running, it doesn't matter where your device is, it will just integrate into your network. When I was speaking about Matter at the Enterprise Workshop, devices were not actually here. Well, Matter devices now, some six months later, there's a click. Um, oh, can we go back slightly? Can we go? There we go. Um, they're actually here. So you can go on Amazon, you can buy um, something like this little Wi-Fi smart plug. Um, same price as pretty much every other smart plug that you can get. Um, but what you'll find if you look at the boxes is that they actually say um, IPv6 network required. And they're it's just there on the back, but when you open up the box, you'll find that it actually says it a bit more prominently. The clicky works. <laughs> there we go. Um, so, yeah. So, users have started getting these because, ooh, Matter is the shiny new technology. They want to play with it. And there's already a lot of confusion. So, you've got users who have their... Um, home network, they've gone down the rabbit hole of disable IPv6 to make things work. And then they find that all of a sudden the network isn't quite working as it should for their brand spanking new Matter devices. There is still obviously a little bit of oddity going on as well. Some Matter environments are using fully linked local, some are using Slack addresses uh, and giving global addresses to devices. So users are having slightly different experiences. But the long and short of it is they're being told IPv6 is required. Some of them obviously don't understand that. They've done things that break IPv6, or they've designed their network at home in a way um, where IPv6 doesn't work, a la stacked NAT routers, because they want better Wi-Fi. Or they've, yeah, they're just trying to think in IPv4. So if you're an ISP, um, expect questions about IPv6 for Matter stuff. Um, in April, I presented that slide, um, and I basically said that IPv4 was holding back IoT. Pretty much still stand by that, but um, with it being the latest hot tech and with Apple, Google, Amazon, Samsung all being behind this, IPv6 and IoT could be steamrolling steam rollering IPv4 out of the way. Might not be such a roadblock. So yeah, at the end of the day, matter is it's here. Um, it's starting to get in the hands of users. And going from a standard in 2019 to actual devices being available in people's homes in 2023 is shockingly fast in the grand scheme of things, I think. And it's getting a lot of momentum. So it's here. It's not just another standard. It's being used. And it's being embraced. And that's all I've got for you. OK, thanks very much, Graham. <laughs> Any questions? So before we take questions, when you did those pings, what was the round trip time up the mountain and back over all those things? Uh, several hundred milliseconds, okay. which was <laughs> not bad given that it was tunnel brokered, satellite, and six low. But it worked. It worked. <laughs> okay, thank you. So any questions for Graham? Okay, we have one from Nick. The box is there. Oh, right, that's convenient. <coughs> So does Matter solve the problem of the internet being down and then being able to control your devices or car or whatever? It doesn't solve it directly, but it does give you more of the tools so that you can run more local hosting. Um, so one of the things I haven't mentioned in this is projects like Home Assistant. 
um, which basically try and bring all of your smart home technology into local control, which you can deal with. Um, Matter makes that step much, much easier because it's all standardized. There are Matter bridges that will work with Home Assistant, and all of a sudden you don't have to rely on the public clouds. So it's a tool, it's not a solution. Okay, I don't see any more questions, so thank you very much, Graham. That's excellent.